So welcome everyone. My name's Emily. I'm a guide with California State Parks and I welcome you to your tour of the Alta California missions. Today we're going to be learning about the history of the missions, the history of the mission I'm at, Mission San Francisco Solano, as well as their effects on the California Indians. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land the mission San Francisco Solano is on is the ancestral land of the Coast Miwok, the Southern Pomo, and the Wapo. They were the first people here before anyone came to colonize this area of Alta California. And that is exactly what Spain was doing here with the missions. They were colonizing it, setting up settlements, essentially taking control of the land away from the California Indians and making it their own. And they did this through the mission system. Now, the idea of the mission system was this, that the priest and soldiers would go into an area. They would round up the local California Indians to become their laborers. They are teaching them trades and customs that they want them to know. In 10 years, these sites were to become self-sustaining, meaning they're producing almost everything they need to survive. At that point in time, the mission could then open up into a town with the California Indians becoming citizens of Spain. The idea behind this was that should another country like England, France, or Russia try to invade, they then had people there to protect that site. However, it never really quite happens this way. But we do know what's going on with the missions if we look at how they are built. So right behind me here, I have a map of the 21 California missions. Now the first mission established was way down south in San Diego. That's mission San Diego de Acala. Spain isn't slowly working their way north building these settlement sites, no. For the second mission established was over 400 miles north in present day Carmel, and that's mission San Carlos Borromeo. So what we see happening in the mission system is actually that Spain is zigzagging up and down along the coastal regions, setting up these settlement sites, setting them up for protection. But they never did become towns in 10 years. And we know this because San Diego was established in 1769. A little over 50 years later, by 1821, this land is no longer under the control of a king of Spain. It has won its independence and now it's officially part of the country of Mexico. But nothing changed in over 50 years. 20 missions were built, being run the same way they always had been. So how does this mission, the 21st and last, get established? Well, come follow me to find out. The mission San Francisco Solano was established by the priest Father Altamira. And Father Altamira was a priest who happened to be working at Mission San Francisco Diocese, a more commonly known as Mission Dolores in San Francisco. And he had an idea. He wasn't happy with the living conditions or things that were going on at that mission. So he wanted to close down Mission San Francisco Diocese as well as Mission San Rafael and just open up a huge mega new San Francisco mission in the North Bay region. Now, in order to do this, he was to get approval by the church. However, initially he got approval by the government. Well, when the church heard about this, they weren't too happy because they weren't really interested in opening or closing any new missions. But with the church and the government working together, by the late summer of 1823, Father Altamira would receive permission not to close any missions, but to open the 21st and what will become the last mission, Mission San Francisco Solano. And if we look at how this mission is built, we get an idea for how a lot of the missions are built because most missions are built on what we call a quadrangle. So it's a four-sided structure with an open courtyard. Now in the case of this mission, we know they started out with building a wooden church first. Churches are important to the mission history, but we'll talk more about that at the end of the tour. So they start out with this wooden church. Next building to go up would have been this one in the front. That's the priest's quarters. Then they start building necessary work and storage rooms. Um, in the back, we have what's known as a monherio or a woman's dormitory. And lastly, they finished off this mission compound with this building right here the much larger church itself. Now those are the buildings, but where exactly do people live at a mission? Well, if you're the priest, you live in the priest's quarters. 
So Father Altamir was here for about three years. He then left, and over this mission's history, there would be three additional priests as its leaders. Uh, missions also had soldiers at them. About 12 soldiers and their family would have lived in their own adobe brick homes. And for the California Indians who were here, the Coast Miwok, Southern Pomo, who numbered anywhere from 600 to 1,000 people, depending on the time of year, they also mostly lived outside the walls in their own traditional homes. So that's the people and the buildings. But did you know missions are also so much more than this? Because they're huge agricultural sites. They have a lot of land. And let's think about why they have this land. Well, first, they're raising animals. So missions raise cows, horses, sheep, goats, mules, oxen, for different purposes of the site. They also are growing a lot of crops or food. Um, major food production at a mission included wheat, barley, beans, like pinto beans, gorbanzo beans. They planted corn. And of course, Spain brought a lot of new plants to the Americas. Things like fruit trees, the oranges and lemons, quince, pomegranates, olives, and grapes. So a lot of land was required to sustain all this agriculture. So in the case of Mission San Francisco Solano, we know the land went about 30 miles north to south, and then about 60 miles east to west. So there would have been one cattle ranch at each side, one on the west side, one on the east side. So when people think about missions today, what they don't realize one of the impacts was, was all that agriculture, what it had on the land surrounding it taking away native plants, uh, driving out native species of animals. So when we're looking at missions, just remember it's more than what we see today. It's all the land that went with it as well. Now we're going to talk about work that went on at a mission. When I'm using terms like laborers, people, workers, remember I'm referring to the California Indians. To start off with, cooking was an important job at a mission. Food had to be made, people had to eat. There was no gas or electricity in the mission era, so wood fire was used for cooking. A lot of that took place outdoors. Imagine people, women, standing around cooking over big pots right here. And then over here, we have an orno or a wood fire oven. When it comes to cooking, three meals were served a day at a mission. The day would start with breakfast. Uh, breakfast typically was a meal of a tole. Tole is like a cream of wheat. So people would come get their breakfast. After breakfast, it was time to go to work. And then midday, it would be time to take a break and come in for the second meal of the day, known as dinner during the mission era, not lunch. And dinner normally was a meal of pozole. So today we know pozole is a wonderful Mexican soup. In the mission era, it's more of a bean soup, like corn, beans, and lentils. And maybe they made some bread in that orno to go with it. After dinner, it was time to go back to work. And at the end of the day, when work was done, people would come in for supper. And normally, once again, it was a meal of atole. So three meals were served a day at a mission. But there definitely were some problems with these meals. First off, they weren't very high in calories. So imagine someone's a field worker. They plow the fields, they're tending to the crops. They exert a lot of energy or calories. If they aren't getting that same amount of calories back through the food they're eating, they could be suffering from starvation. Also, new food groups were introduced into the California Indian diet. Things like cow's milk and the European wheat. Not having these foods before, some people couldn't digest them very well, and they would get sick simply off the foods they were being served. At a mission, sheep were being raised, and sheep were primarily being raised for their wool. So shepherds would raise the sheep, and then come springtime, it's time to shear or cut that wool off. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever smelled wool that came fresh off a sheep, but whew, it has a pungent aroma to it. So the wool would need to be washed and dried. 
After it is washed and dried, it then goes to people who will card it. They simply are brushing that wool out, getting the fibers ready for its next process, which is spinning. So missions had at them big spinning wheels called walking wheels, or they might have had this, a drop spindle, where they could change that wool into a usable piece of yarn. That yarn then goes to people who work the looms, who would make things like sweaters or a blanket. So without stores to go shopping out, people have to use the resources on site. This idea is sustainability, producing what you need. And it doesn't happen very fast. It does take some time. But how is this different for the California Indians? Well, let's think about what people might have been wearing for clothing prior to the missions being here. Uh, maybe they used uh, fabrics or textiles made from hides like deer or elk to create clothing with. Maybe they used grasses to create something like a skirt. But once the missions were here, the priest wanted them to dress like people from Spain. So that meant men had to wear tops and pants. Women had to wear blouses and skirts. Some new styles of clothes, definitely new types of fabrics, were different for the California Indians. But something that didn't change in the mission era was something that the California Indians had been doing for thousands of years and that was making baskets. Now baskets were a tradition that continued on because the priests saw them as a useful item. Many items that were needed at a mission could be made out of basket material. So let's say they needed something to help carry in the harvest. Baskets to carry on the back could be made for that. They needed something to store the harvest. Well, storage baskets were made. You need something to hold water or to cook in. Also, baskets were made for that. So seeing as it was a useful item, it was one of the traditions that was allowed to carry on in the mission era. One of the most important animals being raised at a mission are the cows. And the cows are primarily being raised for their hide and tallow. Now, they also are used for meat and milk, but there's some problems with that. First off, there's no refrigeration in the mission era. So the meat has to be eaten while it's still good. It needs to be preserved if they can't eat it all. And milk, the same thing. It has to be used while it's still fresh. But during the Montanza season, that's the slaughtering season of the cows, they kill 500 cows. There's no way to preserve all that meat. So a lot goes to rot in the fields. So what they're really wanting from a cow is the hide and tallow. So hides, hides are the skin. Those can be used to make leather products. Things like shoes, chaps for the vaqueros, saddles. Even the soldiers took it, layered it up, and made it into armor. Hides also became a huge trade item. They're so valuable in trade, they eventually become known as the California buck because they're exchanged just like cash. Now, for the tallow. The tallow is a the fat of a cow. And tallow goes into a big pot like this one right here. So that would take about three hours uh, with a fire going under to make that a liquid. And when it's a liquid, what people would do is they would take like sticks with strings, several strings going off of it, dipping it up and down in that hot tallow. In about 30 to 40 minutes, they would have created a candle. With no electricity, candles are an important device to use to see when it's dark out. And also with tallow, they did make bars of soap. In the mission era, the courtyards were used as working centers. Um, so in the courtyard at the Mission San Francisco Solano today, you will see that it's kind of sparse. We do have some plantings. We have plants that are native to California, things like the manzanita tree, the grasses. We also have a California buckeye tree. Also planted in this courtyard are plants that Spain had brought to the Americas, like the olive trees and the pomegranate trees. 
uh, typically at a mission courtyard uh, or in that area, there would have been a well or a cistern to create, collect water. Uh, it was important when building a mission to find a water source in the area. So like streams, uh, springs, that was important to have. So they would have water for their own uses. Now I am standing in front of an adobe brick wall. And adobe bricks are what these structures are made out of. When the priest and soldiers go into an area to build, they have to look for the resources on site. What's a resource everywhere? Dirt. Now adobe bricks are a building material that go back centuries. They're even still used today. So in building an adobe brick, there's about five ingredients that go into the making of it. There's dirt, the soil, which is clay or sand, water, straw, grasses, and cow manure. So what's happening is big pits are being dug to turn up that dirt and soil, adding in the straw, the water, the manure as needed. And people would stomp through that mix during the day, mixing it up with their feet. Then they're using rectangular molds to scoop that mix up, plop it in, smooth it out. And these bricks take about 30 days to dry. 30 days is a long time to wait for your building material. Also means people have to be very aware of the rainy seasons where they are at. Because if these bricks were left out to dry in the sun and it starts to rain, they would start to turn back to mesh. So knowing the dry seasons, that's when adobe bricks were made. And then, the walls have to be made. Stacking those adobe bricks, using more of that adobe mix as they mortar or glue in between. As long as these structures had a good solid roof overhead, these buildings can last a long time. But should that roof get a leak in it, the roof collapses, the bricks are exposed to rain, water, they will slowly start to erode or crumble back down. Here are three items I want to share with you from our museum. You will notice at the top of your screen a big giant pot. We mentioned that there were three meals a day being cooked at a mission. Things like soups and stews. Giant pots like these, they need a few of them to feed a few hundred people every day. This rectangular wooden box in front, that's what's called a fanega. And a fanega was a measuring device of the mission era. It was to measure how much corn was planted or how much wheat was harvested. And right here, we have a bell. And bells were definitely something that changed traditional ways of life of the California Indians. Because think about how were people telling time prior to the missionaries being here? Well, they relied on the sun. We know like when the sun comes up in the morning, that helps us to get up during the day. And where it's positioned in the sky, we know our hottest times of the day, sun goes down at night, people would know when it's time to go home. But that would forever change with the bell. And the bell was basically an all day long alarm clock. So it rang to wake people up. It rang to tell them to go, go to church. It rang to tell them to get food. It rang to tell them when to work, break from work, all throughout the day until it called them in in the evening. A definite change in a way of life. Now we enter into the room most recognizable uh, at the missions, and that is the church. Imagine for the California Indians, first seeing this inside of the building, how strange or different it must have been for them. It was really the Catholic Church that changed traditional ways of life of the California Indians. Because prior to the missions being here, one might say that the California Indians were practicing a spirituality or religion based on nature. They gave thanks to an animal when they killed it for its meat. They hoped and prayed for a good harvest of food. They had a creator. But when the missions arrived, the priest wanted them to change to his religion, Christianity, 
And that meant praying to people. Quite a different concept. So how are people adjusting exactly to this new way of life? Well, it's not an easy adjustment. But when we start to look closer at the churches, we start to understand that there actually is an overlapping of old traditions with the new. Because think about who's exactly building these buildings. It's not the priest. Uh, he's the person who's going to say what he wants the building to look like, but he's not really building it. It's not the soldiers. They might be overseeing work, but they aren't doing the majority of it. It is the California Indians who not only build the structures, but also decorate the interiors. So let's look a little bit closer up here at this altar area. So up here at the altar, you'll see a statue in red. That's a statue of Mary. And green is a statue of Joseph. There's the altar table. Uh, there's the crucifix. And then above that is the painting of the saint of this mission, San Francisco Solano. So that's all stuff the priest wants in this room. It's important to him and his religion. But let's look beyond that. Let's look for some California Indian influences. So if we look closer at the walls, you might start to see behind the statues, there's leaves and vines coming out from behind that. Not something we see in a typical modern day church today. There's a lot of patterns going on the walls. And the colors are what we call earthen tone colors. So we know for the dyes and pigments, the colors are being found in nature from things like plants and minerals. And then we look up to the ceiling. So the ceiling's a salmony pink type of color. There's patterns going across the beams. Those are based off of basket weaving patterns. And then there's that bluish gray circle up above. That's what's called the eye of heaven. But whose heaven would depend on who was standing up there? I mean, if the priest is up there, we know the priest is Catholic. He believes in his God. He feels a connection to his God standing under there. But if someone was Pomo standing up there, they have their own creator. So maybe they are feeling a connection to their creator standing up there as well. Another important feature to point out in this church is this pattern. This is a pattern that goes around the whole church. It actually encircles the whole entire room. So let's start at the bottom here. You'll notice this blue line with the brown wave going through it. That's representative of water. Then we have this big tan line going down the center. That actually represents the earth, the land. There are mountains and valleys in this picture, as well as sky, stars, and trees. So now, let's look at this again. And you can see this design is so much more than just that. It's actually a painting of nature. A painting of nature that encircles the whole entire room. In around 1834 is when secularization began. And secularization is a pretty big word. Basically, it means the missions had to do what they were always supposed to do, become towns. Essentially, control of the land was taken away from the church and given to the people. General Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo was the Mexican military official chosen to come secularize the mission San Francisco Solano and start the new pueblo or town of Sonoma. In doing so, he started to take apart some of the mission buildings, repurposing that material, the adobe bricks and the timbers, to start building his own buildings in town, like his house. The church that we're in right now is actually the site of the first wooden built church. He tore that one down and built this adobe brick one in its place. Now this was actually only used as a local Catholic church for about 40 years when the church then sold the property and moved three blocks away. It was in private hands for quite some time until a group bought it and gave it to the state of California in 1906 to become a historic site. You may be wondering though, what happened to the California Indians that were part of this mission after secularization? 
Well, for General Vallejo, as payment for secularizing the mission and starting the town of Sonoma, he would receive a land grant 12 miles west of here. He named it Rancho de Petaluma. So he took a lot of the California Indians and their industries, transported them over there so he could make money off of them. Some he kept in the town of Sonoma to continue to build the town, and others became servants for the Vallejo family. When visiting the Mission San Francisco Solano today, one thing you will notice on the west side is a monument to the California Indians who died while laboring at this mission. From the street, you will see the church that General Vallejo built. And across the street are the barracks he had built for his soldiers. He established the town plaza, and slowly the whole town of Sonoma built up around the remaining buildings of the mission. Today, there is one bell, the priest's quarters, and the church that Vallejo built.